close to me, save that thou art, thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my Welcome, great to see you today, even though I can't see you in this audience, but I know you were at home and hopefully watching this uh, message. And um, I pray everyone is safe and doing well, and hopefully we're on the other side, the downturn of this virus, and we'll be back here fellowshipping and worshiping together very shortly. So Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you're doing in hearts this day. Thank you that many are turning to you. Uh, the, in the midst of this uncertain time, Lord, uh, we just pray that hearts would be looking to you very diligently, perhaps in ways they never have, Lord. We, we do pray for that awakening that many say is occurring throughout the world as a result of this virus and illnesses. And we pray, Lord, that your, your word would go forth, your salvation would go forth throughout this whole planet, Lord, and many would come to you and profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So, Lord, we give you this time. We ask your blessing on this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in John 14, 21, there, there is a verse that comes with a great blessing. And if you read through the New Testament, you, you see that God attaches obedience to his word to a tremendous blessing. And there is certainly a motivation, many motivations, for us to honor God and trust God and obey God. And we see in John 14, 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me will be loved by, loved by my Father. And I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. So we see this tremendous um, command of obeying the commands. There's a commandment to obey the commandments. And with this commandment comes a tremendous blessing of being loved in a personal way, in a deep way, in, in a, a way that we will realize far more than if we live lives 
disregarding the commandments of God. And we experience the love not only of Jesus, but the love of the Father, and he manifests himself to us. And that word manifest, really, it means to disclose, um, it means to reveal oneself as a friend. And we experience a friendship with God that we would otherwise never know if we didn't honor his word and obey his commandments. And I think we do a tremendous disservice um, in our walk of faith if our goal, if our priority isn't to obey the word of God uh, and experience that intimacy that can only come as a result of honoring the scriptures. So we enter into this deeper level. Remember when Jesus said, I, I no longer call you servants, now I, I call you friends because you know all that I'm doing. I'm, I'm disclosing things about my life that only you would know as my friends. And isn't that the purpose of friendship when you think about people that you are friends with? There's certain things you know about their life that others wouldn't know about their life. There's a, a personal exchange, a personal intimacy that takes place, which many times is a motivation for the friendship. Um, friendships might develop, you know, over common interest, you know, sports or, or fishing or whatever people do in, have in common in terms of hobbies or activities. But those people don't necessarily become lifelong friends unless there is a disclosure a revealing of the heart and what we really desire most in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is that he would reveal his heart to us in a personal way and certainly we see his heart in the scriptures we see him in the activities of what the Lord Jesus Christ did as he walked the earth and touched hearts and healed people and, and certainly brought in forgiveness of sin um, but we want to experience that on a personal level we, we don't want to just know about it, but we want to, and about him, but we want to know him. We want to know him. And this is Paul's prayer. This is Paul's great prayer. He so desired to know him. And think about it. <clears throat> I think we're living in a day and age when maybe people don't have or see God as one they truly, truly want to know. And, a lot, and very often we have these very selfish prayers. Um, many people grow up trying to understand who God is and see him kind of as a Santa Claus figure, that he's one that I'm going to present a, a Christmas list to, a, a list of desires to, a list of needs to, uh, Lord, I would like to have this and I would like to have this, I would like health and wealth and, and a Lamborghini and pray that all these things will be brought about and come to pass. And yet people don't really see God for who he is in this day and age. And, I was considering even in uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, where he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. And I am the one that is and I was. And I am the one that is coming. I am the Almighty. And when you begin to recognize who God is and how he holds all things together by the word of his power in Hebrews 1, 3, and in Revelation 1, 18, he says, I am he that was dead, and behold, yet I am alive. And I hold the keys to hell, to Hades, and, and to death. And when we begin to understand who God is, we approach him in humility. We approach him in, in a right perspective of who he is and who we are. And we, we really seek him for who he is. And I think that's so, so critical um, so we just don't simply find our, our, ourselves on our knees motivated by our problems. We find ourselves on our knees motivated by his glory, by his awesomeness, by, by the great things that he, have do he has done for us. Um, we see even in prayer, praying in Matthew 6 in the Our Father, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He is a holy God. He is holy. His kingdom come. It is his kingdom that is relevant for all of eternity, not any of the kingdoms of this world. And we, we need to have a proper perspective of who he is um, in order to live out a life that experiences this friendship and closeness to him. I love this statement, how because where the mind dwells, the heart follows. And, and many of us dwell on things that are beneath. Many of us dwell on things of this world 
and uh, the issues that we're facing, and we don't dwell on Him. And I think prayer offers perhaps one of the greatest opportunities to dwell on who He is and not what we're going through. Because we're all going through stuff. There's not a single person who is going to live their lives and not go through all, all of the variety of circumstances that are appointed to man. And yet, if we can be people who focus on who he is, dwell upon him, then our heart will follow closely to him. I think about the prayer of Paul. Um, who would ever even begin to pray that prayer in Philippians 3.10? Oh, that I might know him. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable to his death. Who prays that way? Well, maybe that's an example, a pattern of how we should pray. And I'm not saying don't pray for health. I'm not saying don't pray for family. I'm not saying don't pray for finances and work circumstances and those things. Those are very, very relevant. And those are concerns of God as well. It's not like he doesn't tell us not to. He, you know, he, he tells us uh, uh, not to be anxious for anything. Right? In a modern version, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. So it's not wrong to pray about everything. It's okay. But don't perceive God as this Santa figure that we're going to present a list to and check off the list. And, um, I think the greatest prayer that I've ever known was Jesus in the garden when he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thy will be done. And that has to be the attitude of our prayer when we approach God. Well, I'm not praying for my will, I'm praying for your will. I'm not praying for uh, my fullness, I'm praying for your fullness in me. Um, if we seek Him for only us, we live our life. We live our life. But if we seek Him for Him, we live His life. You know, and many illustrations are flow through my brain as I consider this. I think of the healings that Jesus did. I, I think of the, the lepers that he held, that, that he healed. Remember the ten lepers and only one, only one leper returned. And, and the healing, really, people, I think the prayer of the nine lepers was, Lord, heal me for me. And the prayer of that one leper who returned and worshipped Jesus was, heal me for you. Lord, heal me for you. Heal me that I might serve you. Heal me that I might honor you. Heal me that I might obey you and enter into a friendship and intimacy that would otherwise never be realized. Lord, whatever takes place in my life and whatever blessing you pour into it, I pray it would overflow into someone else's life that they might know you and desire to experience who you are in this life. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all you're doing in each and every one of our hearts and we pray Lord that you would just allow these words to sink deep down into our hearts and we would be a people who truly desire to seek you with all of our heart and experience a friendship with you that allows us to walk in great blessing every day. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome this morning, Word of Grace Church, to our sixth video preaching sermon since the pandemic. Um, I'm praying that you're healthy and that you're prospering in the middle of this. I pray in the middle of it. And why don't we open with a word of prayer? We pray, Father, right now as we open this sermon, that you would help us with depression. Depression, fear, they're real things. But for the believer, you've given us resources, Lord to run into the cleft of the rock, to hide in you, Lord, to be optimistic, to not look at a cup half empty or half full, but to see, Lord, that you always can make it overflow as we look towards you. So, Lord, this morning, like every day, we look towards you. Help us to have our lamps filled with oil today. Help us to have the perspective that you have for the world we live in. Help us to lean on all the resources you give in the middle of that world. We are in this world, but we are not of it. So, Lord, help us to be your sons and your daughters for your glory. In the midst of a dark world, help us to shine like lights and save us with hope today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 
Well, the Holy Spirit and uh, the Lord in the middle of this has really led me to do an end times series. We're on our second sermon in Matthew 24, uh, hoping to go and take through Revelation a little bit of, of the scriptures. was reading the book of Daniel uh, this week and looking at the prophecies that come from Daniel and his vision of the 70 weeks of Daniel. Uh, also the history of the world in Daniel. Uh, prophecy is always a place to really come and really see historical truth. Historical truth is something that is scientific, yet it's not in the same way that you can take a test tube and you can measure out cause and effect. Uh, it is about what has happened and what has been recorded and what can be validated in history. And history has always had that science and no greater than the scriptures themselves, all the Nostradamuses that people would go after to find his predictions for the future. Nothing is, that he has done or any other prophet of the world has ever come close to what Jesus Christ. The Casey's, no one, that with Jesus Christ, the scriptures, God, the Bible, has prophesied in what's come to pass. When we look at Matthew 24 and we think of prophecies that haven't come to pass yet, we have to look at so many that have come to pass. Israel being a nation right now, like I said last week, and well, I'll say to the end of my days, the greatest miracle of God ever to take place as far as fulfilling prophecy. Not only is it fulfilled that they come back, but it also is uh, the idea of how they came back. In odds uncalculable, in, in odds that would say this could never happen, it's a bet in Vegas that would never even be taken, that somebody who would lose 6 million of its 17 million population of people would come back to their homeland a few years later and begin to refound the nation of Israel not only coming out of that kind of persecution but being surrounded by a billion people that want nothing less than their death being abandoned by the West and the British Empire leaving them to themselves to fight off the Arab hosts uh, they would survive and they would prosper and Flowers would grow in the desert, and they'd become a technological giant in the world we live today. And not only that, they'd be a military might, and some of the top ten of the world Israel would be today to defend themselves. And yet they've had God in the middle of it all. And so we look at these things, and we look at the scriptures knowing that if these prophecies came true, the first coming of Christ, where we're at right now in Matthew 24, and his end week here and days when he gives this exhortation, this answer to the long, the longest answer to the, any question he's ever asked, Matthew 24 of the end times, that gives me hope for tomorrow, that the prophecies will happen. We live in a world right now that Israel exists, so we know there's a temple that can be built and will be built for the Lord to come into or for the Antichrist to come into. The real and final temple will be when he comes and brings the temple down from heaven as the scriptures say. But we know Israel exists. We also know that we are, especially today, we are in a one world uh, government with foundations that are being built stronger and stronger every year, that we have that capability to unite all nations together. We have UNs and we have internet and we have technology that brings us together. It's interesting the whole world is in this pandemic. Even talking to friends on the mission field in faraway lands in India and in Israel, that they are all bunkered down with a pandemic. How fear can fly around the world in a few minutes. We're in these days. And so we look at Matthew 24, and one of the reasons I look at Matthew 24, it was one of the major things that led me to Christ, to see that God has a plan. And God's plan still holds true. As a Christian, that gives me great hope. For someone out there that doesn't believe in God, hopefully that will bring you to the hope that I believe in. That I don't have to panic in the middle of this. This has already been written down that would happen. And that in the middle of all these things that are happening, you know what? I've got a God who will hold my hand and keeps me in His hand through it all. Therefore, you know what? That takes fear away from me in the middle of a people that are ridden with fear. I don't have to panic like the world because I'm not of the world. And so I want this hope to really uh, 
permeate your lives and really cast light into all the shadows that darkness would bring us into, which always brings fear and phobias. We need to live. If you don't know Christ today, you need to find life to live. But for Christians, we have life and we need to live it. So I want to look at, at Matthew 24, we're in the beginning chapters. What we talked about last week was the idea here, and we actually talked about it in uh, studying the Bible this morning, our hermeneutic class, that I need to know what Jesus thinks. One of the reasons I went to seminary after I got saved, after being tossed to and fro so many times in my early Christian years, is I need to know the mind of God. I realized that my mind didn't work too well. Still doesn't work too well, but maybe the Holy Spirit will help me today. I had to realize that my opinion really meant nothing. And that, you know what, we all have opinions, but do they really have any substance to them? I realized being saved that the only opinion that really mattered was God. And the closest I would get to it, not just to knowing what He loves, what He hates, but how He thinks, not just yesterday, but today. How he thinks today in the world that I live. What would Jesus do in the world that I live? What's he want to do through me in the world that I live in? Those questions should permeate every Christian who seeks to be mature. And every one of us should have a desire to be mature because the more ready you are to face any crisis that comes, the more you will stand in that crisis. The less you have a plan, or at least know someone who has a plan and follow that like we do God, the more we're going to be in chaos, fear, phobias, and we're going to be tossed and cast down. So, you know what? I don't like being cast down. I like to stand. And I realize the only thing I could stand in is the grace of God through the Holy Spirit who's going to illuminate me and help me prepare for what's going to come. Matthew 24, we're in the Passion Week here. We just have come out of this at Easter, and we are back in it to look at some things we normally don't look at through that week as we focus mostly on the Gospel. But Jesus also has time to focus on what will come. What will come in the days of His church? You know, we all look at these, I think I say over and over when we look, the only thing that we can really, really fear greatly is our own demise. Yet for the believer, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody really wants to die. Paul didn't have that attitude. He said, for me to die is gain. I'm not going to bring it on myself. But if I die, I know there's a crown waiting for me because I know who I walk with. It shouldn't be a mature answer from any believer that I don't have a phobia of death. And I also have a great joy to know where I'm going and who I'm going to see. Jesus, loved ones that have gone on. The other thing when we talk about the end times is everybody wants Jesus to come back. We get very excited about that, and I have no lack of excitement to see him who died for me and to see loved ones that I want to see. But I also realize there are judgments. I also realize that before Jesus comes, the Antichrist has to come. Nobody's praying for Antichrist to come quickly. But if Jesus comes quickly, so before him has to come the man of perdition that Daniel brings out in Daniel 9 and that Jesus will bring about here in the tribulation in this prophecy in Matthew 24. So I have to realize that, you know what, these things have to come on all the earth, but I have to realize also that in the middle of that God is with me. Who can be against me? I have to build myself up in the faith. I can't look at the world, I'm not of the world, I can't look at the world and, and let it drive me crazy. A lot of us, you know what, we need to really step back the, the propaganda of the world system. We need to hear the not propaganda but the truth from heaven, who's pro me because he died for me. I need to hear his voice more and I hear, need to hear the media of the world. I need to have sanity instead of insanity. Matthew 24, we find ourselves in a place like this. We talked last week about the disciples had this hermeneutic um, eschatology, which is end times idea in themselves. They believed that the predominant eschatology they were definitely looking for, I think anybody in trial who believes in God, especially the God of the Bible, they were the Jews, they were the God, the people of the Bible at the time. There was no church. They had a strong eschatology that the Messiah was going to come. They were looking for the Messiah. Any godly people in the middle of, of travail are going to look for what? Salvation out of it. They're going to look for the Messiah. 
And they believed the Messiah was going to come all through history, even from um, the beginning, from 315 of Genesis, we have the first promise that there will be a seed that will come from a woman, speaking of a virgin birth, by the way, because all seed comes from men, but there'd be a seed coming from a woman, substantiating the virgin birth, and that seed would what? Crush the great serpent, Satan, would just deceive them under his what? foot. That's from the beginning of the Bible. We believe that. The prophets magnify that coming. And the Jews definitely believed in it. They believed in one coming. We all tend to go to the place which is more beneficial to who we are and who we want to be. They went to the, better, the idea that this Messiah was going to come. He was going to come quickly. They, they believed they were in tribulation. Being under the Roman Empire at that time was no picnic. It was definitely totalitarianism. It was definitely the sword if you disobey. They had been crucified by the thousands even before the crucifixion of Christ. And they were looking for what? Freedom. They had just come off the Maccabean rebellions that, that threw out Greece or one of the fingers of Alexander the Great, one of the armies that took over that reign of that area. They had a taste of independence and then they were right back under the hoof of Rome. And this was even more brutal. They were looking for a Messiah. Their eschatology said they'd go through this suffering and a Messiah would come. They realized that, you know what, that the temple they lived in by Herod the Edom might mean. He was an Arab. It was not a sanctified temple, but that's what they had to use. And it was beautiful and it was better than the first uh, ones that were built before. And they used it, but they realized it was corrupt. Jesus went into it and he worshipped, but he cast out the money changers. He knew it was correct. He knew it was a den of thieves. And he's going to do this the Passion Week. The first thing he does when he comes in, into the city after looking around, he comes the next day and he casts all the tables over like he did in the beginning of his ministry. In the book of John. He did it twice in his ministry. Early ministry, later ministry. At the end of the Passion Week. He's going to go a few more days, and then he's going to preach what we, we go into here, Matthew 23, which is the most brutal, final, uh, basically giving up on Israel as a nation and turning God turning his back from the nation of Israel and going to the Gentiles uh, in the book. Matthew 12, it begins the process when they call him visible. It's the, what we call the unpardonable sin. They call Jesus Satan... For doing the work of God. And that is where Jesus begins to speak in parables. He finalizes it in Matthew 23. When he curses it up, up, up and down. And he doesn't call it his father's house anymore. He says your house shall be what? Your house. Not my father's house. Now your house will be left to you what? Desolate. Now you remember the context. I don't think anybody could be in the rage and this is for all you complete pacifists out there, don't believe in anger. There's a place for righteous anger in the world we live in. There's a place where God would rise us to anger, but sin not. Jesus is in a rage here. He's a rage. He has wrath and the cup of wrath he's going to talk about being built up for them. And wrath is always really uncontrollable anger. It's where collateral damage comes in. It's one of the reasons we believe that there's a rapture. Is it that it talks about it directly in Matthew 24, but it's deduced in the idea that God will not what? Pour his wrath out on his own children. We have the idea of, of the ancient world with Noah, where he pulled him out. We have the idea of Sodom, where God even pulled unrighteous Lot out and made him righteous, which he did for all of us on the cross. But we have these things understood, and he is, he is at the froth of wrath in Matthew 23, cursing them up and down, woe unto you, a curse unto you, scribes and Pharisees, all the way through Matthew 23. This is the context for Matthew 24. In the middle of that, you see, you see his anger, but you also see at the end, and we talked about this last week, his mercy, his heart. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He says it again here. He said it going into the Passion Week. He says it again here. I would have gathered you like chicks, like a mother, but you would what? 
I would have gathered you up, but you would not. God can't make anyone do anything. God wants to change them. He, they wouldn't be changed. God wants to change me. When we enter into Matthew 24, then time prophecies are all about God getting people to repent. There's a bad word today. We need to really look at that and say, is it God that says it's a bad word or is it the world that says it's a bad world? Is it me because I don't like that word? And I'm conditioned to say, oh, repent, repent. The first words of Jesus in the book of Matthew are repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And if it's not good, well, that's Jesus' word, his messenger, which we're supposed to be. The first words of John the Baptist were repent for the kingdom of God are, is at hand. God's always looking to change us because He can't love us the way we are. So He wants us to what? Change. He wants us to be what? Like Him. So when we face the Scriptures of Matthew 24, the disciples had this viewpoint of viewing everything that was being done in their own hermeneutic, their own opinion, the opinion of the Talmud. And the Talmud definitely brings out that they were usually in the eschatology, the Jews. Why? Because they believed they were the chosen, chosen people. And all they could really justify in their arrogance, their what? Their slavery and their bondage is what? That, you know, God is allowing this to happen to come and magnify and lift us up from all this with what? A Messiah. And then we will be the leaders of the world. This wasn't one of humility for the Gentiles. There was one of arrogance to rule over them, to turn the tables in their own pride. They didn't want to hear anything else. You know, it's most of us when we talk about repentance, we don't want to hear anything else. We don't want to hear, nobody wants to hear they're wrong. In fact, when you, you can see anybody's pride, myself included, that when I tell you it wrong, if, if you know Christ, you have to fight down your first impulse to react but most of us react automatically, like you hit a knee uh, at the doctor's office and the knee pops up. Most of us, re it's systematically reaction to the thing. Don't tell me I'm wrong. Can I tell you something? God will constantly point out your shortcomings. It's hard to love somebody that constantly pour points out your shortcomings. He may not do it all at once, or maybe breaks it, and he'll tell you he loves you too, and he loves you, and that's why he's pointing out things that you need to get rid of because they're unlovely. You have to realize that you know the scriptures are constantly where, like one of my favorite proverbs is six 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 twenty three. Maybe you'll understand me with that. That thy word is a lamp and a light. The filling of the Holy Spirit is the way to read the scriptures. To have the mind of God. But thy way is a lamp and a light unto my feet. And reproof and instruction, really bringing about the place that to show you you're wrong, to change you, to be like God. The, so the proverbial writer says what? Are the ways of life. In other words, I've got to be a person that loves reproof and instruction. I have to take criticism, what people say, oh, we should never criticize. Well, reproof and instruction is always a form of criticize. Criticism, but I have to understand the person that's saying should be saying it, speaking the truth in love. And no one loves me more than God. He came and He died for me. And you know what? I have to learn to receive that to be more and more like Him. So we have His mind. Matthew 23, the disciples loved Jesus, they followed Him, but they didn't have His mind. Now, maybe in the context of their hermeneutic, you understand why they were so big on who would be the greatest. Matthew 24, we'll, we'll read the beginning verses again. Jesus comes out of this tre tre tremendous anger fest. Now, I don't know about you, if you've ever been really angry, I usually can't calm down in five minutes. If I'm this angry, the anger still has an afterglow on me for a little bit while, more in a day. And Jesus is walking out of it, so they're trying to calm him down and Jesus is walking out of the temple. His disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. They're trying to get him, you know, he just went on a major, major rampage here. And they're trying, like anybody you love, you're trying to calm my wife. If I was on a rampage, she'd be beside me saying, well, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, look at the temple, look at the area. It's something to get you out of it. And, you know, he looks at it and he does it. He, he's in his rage and he looks at this thing. He goes, see the buildings of the temple? 
And Jesus says he's in his right. Yeah, they're great. Do you see these all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon the other that shall not be thrown down. That's pretty good rage. He just told them their house would be desolate. He sees the temple. No big deal to Jesus. He's been in heaven. Not one stone will be left upon the other that will not be cast down. And he's walking over and up the hill to Mount Olivet. This is the Olivet Discourse. The next two chapters, 24 and 25. And uh, he's walking up there and they get to this place in verse 3. And now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, beautiful garden, beautiful olive trees, the disciples came to him privately saying again, Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now they want to know because and the words here really mean out when. Because the idea here when, this is how they viewed this thing. They believe, they aren't asking like, is it going to happen in 2,000 years? They're asking this, is it today or tomorrow? Is today or tomorrow, you, are you setting up your kingdom? Is it next week? How long? The, the viewpoint in the Greek here isn't like, you know, well, it's going to be like at least 3,000 years away. No, 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 no. We understand it's going to be today or tomorrow. See, they saw this in an eschatology of like, okay, we've been in tribulation. We know that this was built by Herod. This whole temple is tainted. We know there's money changers. You just cast them out. This is what the Messiah would do. He's coming to sanctify his people. He wants to get rid of the hypocrites. We understand that. We're on a ride here with you, and we realize that we are going to be what? We're going to have front row seats to the new kingdom. You understand why they wanted to be concerned about who was the greatest? They thought it would happen right away, and so was the eschatology, eschatology of the Jews. That he would destroy the temple, and he just said he would destroy the temple. That fits eschatology, doesn't it, for them? And he said, you know what, but they knew that he would destroy all the wicked, and then he'd rule over the nations. And they were his disciples. This answer to this brings this away from the when immediately till this is a long time away. This is a ways away. This isn't going to happen. This started to bring in the idea, and, and they still asked him. Even after he said all this, even as he's going to Gethsemane later, they're still talking about who's the greatest. It doesn't fit because their mind is so locked in. Have you ever been like this? And are you like this? Because you are. Their mind is all locked into their pre-perceived pre doctrine of this is the way it has to happen, that you can't get them to budge. Stubborn as a mule. They are not going to budge on what they believe, even when the Messiah is right in front of them. When they hear about death, they're like it goes in one ear and kind of out the other because they're so focused on what they want to be focused in. They can't see any peripheral vision of anything else. Jesus, when he gives this answer, he's going to give it all the way through Matthew uh, 24 here and also in the 25. He's got to kind of try to blow their bubble a little bit about the eschatology. Some of them still don't necessarily get it all. But it's interesting, and some scholars talk about this, is when Matthew 26 happens, you'll see Judas begins to depart from this whole scene and go get money because he's in it for what? He's in it for the fame, the glory, and the wealth. He's in it for that. He's a thief and he wants what's in the bag. And when this whole scene looks to unravel, in one sense he wants to get his 30 pieces of silver if that's all he can get out of it. But he's been following it for three years. And you know what? It's not panning out the way he thought it would pan out. A lot of movies portray that. Portray what's happening in Judas' life, how he wants that to happen. And the disciples weren't far away from the same idea as Judas. They believed it. Jesus begins to blow their bubble. And so the idea here I want you to get, and I want to turn to Philippians chapter 2 with this, is I've got to know the mind of God. Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to go through a quick exegesis Jesus of this, because I think it's the best place that really gives us the idea of the mind of God. One of the hermeneutic rules we learned today, and the first one in reading the Bible, is that 
I've got to have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit, as a believer, if you have, if you receive Christ, you receive the Spirit of God. He interprets the Bible and the mind and the nature of God. He's able to give you a gift of repentance because it's almost impossible for you in the natural to repent. I won't say it's impossible. I don't know. But as a rule of thumb, guess what? People don't change themselves. God changes people. People may change in small little uh, microcosms, but macro, they don't change. They don't change in the whole. They'll change in one point, they'll stop drinking alcohol, but they'll have a thousand other addictions besides alcohol, and their real nature will never change. God changes people. God wants to change me, and He wants me to change in the what? What's, what's a change meant to? He wants me to change Him to be like Him in the quality of who He is, or the nature of who He is. To do that, you know what, he's going to use two main motivators because besides knowing something to change, where it hits my will, I have to be motivated to change. In other words, it has to be moving. It can't be some kind of uh, potential energy. It has to move into kinetic energy. It has to have action. It has to have movement and power. My Christianity, I might know about it, but it has to do what? It has to begin to be active and moving in the world around me. What would you, if Jesus comes into my life, what would it look like? What would I be about if I could say Jesus possessed me? What would I be doing? How would I look at the world around me and how would I act in the world around me? We said that last week or the week before, the church, what would the church look like you if you were in control to make that church be? How would it look? Would people be coming to Christ? You are the church. And Jesus is in you if you are. How does that work out? How does that look to the world around you? Well, we know how Jesus looked to the world he lived in. He was loving. He was angry. He was real. But he was bent on one thing, the truth. And he gave us the grace to take it because he loved us. And he uses two motivators in the heart, which are fear and love. And Paul talks about him in Philippians 2. Philippians is a is suffering church, is the backdrop of this. He's trying to comfort them. I pray that these words comfort you. They don't get you mad and angry. But they make you face reality because God's looking at our real people in the reality of who he is. So he wants us to be real. Paul talks to them. He says, if there's any consolation and all this is going on, we can put it in today's context in Christ. If there's any comfort of love, using love as the prime motivator, which God wants me to be motivated with. If there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if God is working through me, and God's end result that He became flesh, the Spirit became flesh, is that the flesh become what? My life, Spirit. Or motivated in high uh, motivation and priority in what the Spirit wants to do in this world, what God wants to do in this world. If there are any fellowship with the Spirit. I've got to agree with the Spirit to have fellowship with the Spirit, by the way. Two can't walk together unless they do what? Agree in Amos 3.3. 3. I need to say amen to the Spirit. His will be done, not mine, as Pastor Steve was saying. If there's any fellowship with the Spirit, I've got to agree with what God wants to do. If there's any affection and mercy, fulfill ye my joy. The motive, the motive and the emotion of what? Grace. Kara, by being what? Like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Now, this is the nature. Now, you can look at that and say, well, that's kind of like controlling. None of it's right. None of it's the best thing for me. None of it's the will of God who made me and plans for me to prosper. And has his ways, my ways ordered in his plan. Not if it's for what? my complete benefit for all eternity. No, I need to know this. I need to agree. I need to have the sound mind because He's God. He has a plan. I don't have a plan. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition because God's a giver. That's not the nature of God. And this goes back to the nature of God. God doesn't have this high ambition. He already has all things. Nor conceit. God's humble, as we'll read. He's not conceited. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem each other better than himself. 
That takes God to do that. God has to do that. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interests, but for the interests of others. I need to get off my own pedestal. I need to get into the mind of God. I need to get into the weakness. I'm made strong in that. In verse 5, he says, let this mind be within you. It was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, he had everything to boast of, he conceded about. True, he's God. He did not consider it robbery to be what? Equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those in earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God and the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my present only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation. We're all in this place if we're saved. If you're not, I need to get saved. You need to get saved. I need to work out my own salvation. In what? In love? No, 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 no. Wait, wait. In fear and trembling. How many of us fear and tremble anymore? They were quoting Richard Wormbrand about the end times, knowing that some of my loved ones may end up on the other side of the coin at the coming of Christ. They may be the goats. They may be the ones in gnashing of teeth. We don't like to live in those ideas. Most of us don't even like to face death. Think about that. I need in my own life to have his mind. I need to what, plan my own demise or my own future, whatever may come for my demise. Knowing that I have a plan for my rising, that God has that in his hand. The world is going to try to bury me. But I also believe God has a plan to lift me up. I need to have that mind in me. And you know what? I need to have fear and trembling to stay in that place. I need to have that. When I read in 25 of Matthew 25 that, you know what, there are, there are many interpretations, but the idea of the ten virgins that they come and five don't have oil, guess what? Guess what I need to understand what's happening today? I need facts, but I also need the Holy Spirit. I need to say, God, fill my lamp today. Help me to see the world around me. Help me to see the hope of your coming. Help me to have what I need, body, soul, and spirit, right now, that I might live the life that you died for me to live and that you might live what? Through me. And that my salvation might be worked out, not just in love like he starts with, that's the high motivator, but also in a fear and trembling not to be motivated by love, to live in apathy, to refuse to move because I'm apathetic. Welcome to the world we live in. That's all around all of us today. To live in sublimation. That, you know what, I'm going to live my life in front of a computer screen, a TV screen. I'm going to be motivated by the news. I'm going to be motivated by this, by that, instead of being motivated for what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to me. Do I fear that I'm not motivated by the Spirit? Do I have any fear of that? If I don't have any fear of that, then I'm, I'm potentially a person with no oil in His light. Or I don't care about it because God loves me. God loved the Pharisees too. But the Pharisees did what? They didn't receive Him. They rejected Him. You see, when I don't receive him and when I don't occupy myself with him till he comes, like the great parable in Luke 19, he came to seek and save the lost, but occupy till I come, is what he said in the next verse. And he goes down into what? The talents. He'll do that here in this discourse. He'll go into the talents. Part of this whole Olivet Discord will end with a parable of the talents. He gives you something. What do you do with what he gives you? 
Dave Ramsey points that out in the idea of, of wealth in the sense that we are managers of the what? The money of God, the grace of God, and that means whatever God's favor gives me in this life to help me to prosper, I'm to be a what? Manager and a giver of it. From wealth, not just wealth of money, but to my own life. To do what? To lift Christ up from the world that all men would be drawn to him. And not say that's not my responsibility. Listen, the minute you get saved to fill up the suffering of Christ and to walk with him, you take on his responsibility. His responsibility was to save the world, so is yours. To save your loved ones. And to not be apathetic about that. Well, God has that all covered. No, 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 no. I need to make sure my salvation and for those I love and for those I don't love that I need to know and love in the scriptures, I need to try to make sure their salvation the best I can do with the resources I have. The least I need to do is pray. The most I need to do is pray and move. I love the book of Acts because you know what they did? They didn't just pray. I'll pray for you. That's such a great uh, bunch of... I won't even go into it. Get, get me angry. I'll pray for you. How about like, you know what, the book of Acts. You know what they did? They prayed and they went. They prayed, and you study the book of Acts. They prayed and they moved. They prayed and they saw themselves as the answer to their prayers. In other words, as the messenger of their prayers. You pray and God says, you know what, you want your, your, uh, you know, your relative saved or your friend saved? So send I you as the answer to that. Go share with them. Oh, I can't do that. I prayed for them. We need to be people to pray and move. Motivation leads us to this idea of what? If I won't do it because of love, then I need to do it because of fear and trembling and work that out. Because God will judge me. And God will judge the quick and the dead. For God works in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And listen, the, I say your will become, his will, your will be done and come, your kingdom. It's in me, isn't it? The kingdom of God's within me. He wants to do for his good pleasure. If I, listen, it's the God of the universe. I heard a message today by, by someone today is, is your greatest enemy and your greatest fear. And you know, most Christians, when you, you ask them, they go, well, it's the devil and all that. It's not the devil. Do you know the greatest fear you should have in the world is God? You should be, the greatest fear you should have isn't a pandemic. The greatest fear you should have is God. And therefore, what, if you're a believer, what you do in the pandemic, you should be fearful about doing. If you take the mind of the world, then you should be fearful because God hates the world. If you take the mind of the Spirit, then you should be calm in the middle of a pandemic and shine out the hope of all hopes in any pandemic or any malady. And the greatest malady in people's life isn't a pandemic, it's sin itself that brought in a pandemic. You should be more afraid of God. Because God, like Jesus said, that God had, didn't just have the power of death, He had the power to throw both body and soul into what? Hell. And God still has that power for all of us. I need to be afraid of God. And again, that's lost today because we don't repent today. That's a bad word. Fear God, I just want to love Him. But the love we have isn't the full love of the Bible. It isn't truthful, it isn't real. And therefore you wonder why Christianity has no effect? Because it's not real in most people's life. And that has perviated the church of Jesus Christ. We all want grace and we all, cut, we all want grace. But grace in James 4, 6 only comes through one way. It's a very conditional way. You've got to be humble. And therefore I have to have the mind of God. And therefore a church that moves has to have his mind at the same way as the beginning of this chapter. If I have God's mind, then what? Uh, what will happen to me? I'll do all things without complaining and disputing, in verse 14. That you may become blameless, harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a what? Crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights of the world. That's why you have to be different than the world in this pandemic. For a Christian to fear anything but God is blasphemy. That means the world has more impact on you than God does. 
And that is idolatry, by the way. The news channel has more impact on me than God does. Doesn't mean I walk around like a fool. Doesn't mean I don't do different things to keep myself healthy. All those things are true. Right now, I'm in the middle of a pandemic. Guess what? I should be doing things to keep myself strong. I should be, you know what, exercising, taking a walk. I should be taking vitamins. I should be doing anything I can to perpetuate my own bodily health. That's smart to do. Why? Because that will affect my spiritual, my soul strength, my spiritual strength. Because they're interwoven. How about my emotions and my will and my mind? I should be feeding my mind with God's Word. Nutrients for it. Like listening to this message. Reading the Bible for yourself. Feeding yourself. I should have a strong mind. I should have strong emotions. Because what's the sense of a strong mind and a strong body? But my emotions are weak. I should have strong emotions and the right emotions when God wants to let me be what I need to be for the time. Whether it's anger, love, fear, whatever motives or emotions I should have, God knows. And therefore, the filling of the Holy Spirit helps me obey for the situation. I should also have a strong will whenever I go into obedience. I need to shine like lights to the world. I don't want to. I want to stay in my house. Shame on you. I don't hide from sickness. We don't hide from the, what the world can do or this world can do to this body. We prepare for it and we go forth like lights to the world. We don't live in fear. It's not a light. It's taking your whole life and throwing it under a basket or burying it in the ground like you're almost dead. We rise like lights to the world, not as fools, but as lights. Hey, you wear a mask? Fine. You social distance? Fine. But I don't curl up and die. How, how do I deal with depression? And this is depressing times. I find ways out through the Spirit of God and relationships with people to minister to people. So many people are depressed. And yet so we have a reason to, but I tell you what, there's people out there that need you to call them, to love on them, family members, church members. Find a way to communicate to people because the world is moving to what? Against the saints to depress them and God's trying to move towards us to rise us from the dead and give life to people. And you know what? I'm going to do that with the love of God, the mind of God, the heart of God, the will of God, His kingdom come in my life, and I'm going to move in the world I am and I'm not going to fear that world. But I am going to fear God. I have more fear of not acting than, than, uh, than not acting than acting. Okay? Or let's put that in the world. I have fear of like me not acting for God and just sitting back. I have more fear of that than any pandemic or anything the world has. I need to move forward into what I believe. And I need to not fear. And therefore, you know what? In this whole chapter, we need to be holding fast the word of life in verse 16. I need to hold it fast. I need to not let the mind of God, the heart of God, the will of God in my own mind. I need to hold it fast. People are going to want to pull it out. You know, I, I've been angry more than once in this pandemic because you start confessing faith. But to be like, wait a minute, you're crazy. We have to do this. We have to stay in the house for 18 months. Hey, wait a minute. I'm like, you're not going to pull the word of life out of my hand. Because it's the only antidote I have for the word of death. I have the word of life, and I'm going to hold it fast. So that I might boldly rejoice in the day of Christ. That I have not run in vain, nor labored in vain. That's Paul's heart, that's Paul's mind, and that mind's the mind of God. And he's running a race. Christians, we need to get back to running the race in any way, shape, or form you feel safe to do it and the Holy Spirit leads you. But we need to stand and we need to move and we need to shine. This is a great opportunity for the church, but we need God's mind. I can't say it enough, we need God's heart. We need to interpret the world situations we in, we're in by God. God already told us the world situations that would be. Pestilence will come. But God keeps me from the pestilence. I need to believe that. That's my greatest defense. That's my greatest alleviation for depression. That's my greatest rejoicing and hope. That God has all this in His hands. He has a plan. I need to follow Him, not me, Him.
I need to follow him, not him me. Excuse me. I need to follow him. Let's be his people. Let's be his children. Let's give him pleasure in the midst of a world with none. Father, we ask these things today, Lord. Help us in the middle of whatever we're in. Give us tremendous courage, because you have courage. We hold your hand. Therefore, we boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I not, will not fear what this world or men can do to me. Amen and amen. God bless you all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.